I V M. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Kewal Ramani, and today I have with me Sankal Gurjar and Suyash Desai, and we are going to be talking about India's foreign policy. More specifically, we are going to be doing an audit of Indian foreign policy as it stands today. Uh, and this, we take this off from uh, the Indian Foreign Minister S. Jay Shankar's speech last week at the Fourth Ramnath Goyanka Memorial Lecture. Um, it was a long speech, uh, six thousand words, as I'm told. He sort of did an audit of Indian foreign policy through the ages. He spoke about Nehru's vision. He spoke about subsequent changes, and he spoke a little bit about what India is doing today. So okay, so without sort of going into the details, I'm just going to ask both my guests, Sankalp and Suresh, to give me their initial impressions on the speech. What did you think of it, Sankalp? I heard the speech and then I read the full text and also followed the kind of media commentary slash narrative that came out. And initial reaction was that okay, foreign minister has given a speech, which means that the government is now setting out its own sort of vision of foreign policy of the past as well as what it seeks to achieve. Hmm. There were certain claims in the media that this speech is a little, not little actually, a lot. Sort of, you know, it offers certain vision, but I'm not really sure. I mean, they claim to be different, but it's not that different. I mean, yeah. So, so we didn't get a sense of what, uh, how he sees the world today, or how India sees the world today. But that's going to be the big discussion that we're going to have initially. Uh, Just one point I want to add here is that before this regime come came to power in 2014, uh, we had Shiv Shankar Menon as NSA. We had other. Uh, foreign secretaries and they used to regularly give out speeches in media or yeah. uh, for these occasions and so you had a sense what the government is thinking at that particular point of time but because these people i mean people in government do not necessarily talk so much now yeah it's because of this that you know something is coming out in public domain and you can sort of talk yeah. about it it's like that <laughs> okay all right okay so yes your initial thoughts on the speech uh, so it was a simple speech it was a textbook speech mm. just refreshing all the history mm. um so i'll not go into history but one point specifically i paid a lot of attention to uh, that's uh, and that's very brave of dr jay shankar so he highlighted things that could have went that could have gone other way hmm. for instance 1962 war hmm. 1974 to 1998 hmm. uh, 1998 we declared ourselves as peaceful uh, yeah. as a nuclear weapon state yeah. could he he implied that could we have done that before in 1974 then we would have sat on the right hand side of the uh, all yeah. the with all five p5 the powers hmm. could we have opened our economy we were opened we opened our economy because of force hmm. could we have opened 10 15 years ago when asian countries were opening it hmm. uh, nuclear deal what happened to the nuclear deal hmm. could have it have gone other way we signed the nuclear deal but there was no follow up so could it have gone other way hmm. so these are few and f- plus other few points hmm. these are some brave uh points to make as a former diplomat i understand that he is a foreign minister now hmm. but speaking out so clearly hmm. uh he's considered that there are few mistakes he did not say the word mistakes but there are few things which you could have done differently in the past yeah and what are so my question to the speech is what are we learning from it yeah in future how do we apply how do we take corrective actions from these mistakes so for example nuclear deal yeah so due to the domestic pressure mm. i understand it was a coalition government due to domestic pressures we didn't go for the nuclear deal mm. uh, we went it with lot of log jam and monsing had to stand up and then we went for the nuclear deal yeah but it didn't go through completely so what are the learnings is the essential so, question so the deal went through completely what was the issue was the the issue where we were stuck were, was the liability mm. uh, clause <laughs> clause of it yeah uh, and i think i'm not sure i'm not sure but is that so is that has that, i think that's been cleared right now we have a clear liability clause mm. 
also entire global nuclear industry is mm-hmm. also changed in the that's, wake of fukushima yeah so i think that's the bigger issue that happened with that right mm-hmm. where uh, after the fukushima incident uh, mm-hmm. so the I mean, focus on nuclear energy sort of went down but could we have done that differently uh, this and other things yeah. yeah this and other things yeah i mean those are counterfactuals that you could go back into and you could start thinking about how you would do things and but like you rightly said that we need to look at what have we what are we doing today hmm. um and in that before i launch into my big broad question that i wanted to ask one of the since you raised this particular thing um the fact that he spoke about us not having liberalized our economy earlier unless circumstances just required us to we had very little option left um i don't see us taking those sorts of political risks anymore given what we just did on the rcep it is a clear example of a case where you could have entered an agreement which would have had long term potential benefits for you yet there would be certain kinds of short term pain it would requ- it would have required not just reforms to have entered the agreement over the years having that sort of a vision that if you are going to get into this we need to undertake some painful reforms economic reforms we didn't do that uh, when time when push came to shove we backed away from the agreement um, which tells you that that appetite for fundamental reforms to be able to become a competitive economy uh, is still not there um and only this will only happen when there is a position where you are in, uh, where you're still locked and you're trapped and you have no other options left that appetite is that vision is still not there but that's it that is the classic criticism done for indian foreign policy right it is often said that indian foreign policy is reactive and not active so whenever you are pushed to a corner then only you react which was 1991 so yeah and 1991 was a case of yeah. you had no other option left yeah. and my point is if if the foreign minister is saying that uh, uh, we must engage in counterfactuals mm-hmm. uh, and like you rightly said the point of engaging in counterfactuals is to learn to not make the same mistake i am afraid we just did something very similar right now interestingly in the speech itself he says that and i quote risk taking is an inherent aspect of diplomacy wonderful they took the risk i with, mean i would say with the, with the rcep i mean okay let's 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 go into this let's go into this let's go into this with this broad question which which will address the issue of risk taking um so when jayshankar spoke about the world as it stands today and i read those sections of his speech uh, i paid more attention to that that section of his speech he doesn't to me he failed to outline a vision of how india sees the world today um what he did say is that look things are in flux and it's very difficult to describe what the current environment is like it's very difficult to capture it in one phrase or something like that and that was sort of his take away of the current environment the things are changing quite rapidly and this requires us to be much more nimble and us to be you know do things at a much sort of quicker pace be more fleet footed and all of that but he didn't seem to firstly have a view on what's happening in the world and that may be fair i might be being quite harsh on him by saying that he needs to have a view things are in flux the second thing is even if you don't have a view of where the world is right now and if your view is that it's in flux right now that's fine but where do you want to steer it and where do you see india's role in doing that and at the end of whatever your steering would be where do you want to see india placed I think that to me was missing in his speech. Um I want to know your thoughts on that because let's look at because if you don't have that then whether you take risks whether you do multi alignment um what is the purpose of doing that? No purpose of doing that is to secure national interests as as plain and as simple as that but I agree with you that he does not have any any sort of outlines of the new world that india wants to see hmm. or even india anticipates to see yeah i mean compared it with others who have sort of you know spoken about such things you know yeah. now i clearly remember shushankar menon used to speak about say role of force in the changing world order yeah and stuff like that so you could sort of anticipate that you know at the highest levels of government what sort of thinking is going on yeah. this is basically like you know it's sort of like it reads like a report card yeah this is what we are done something is here something is there our approach is like this hmm. but what what is it i mean what what to what goals or you know yeah, where I, where do we i'm going to i'm going to read out because i highlighted the section where he speaks about the current environment and he says this he says a changing world is clearly a more actionable one for those who do not wish to be left behind um he talks about the need for a clearer definition of interests 
which is the next step and this is determined by the pursuit of that uh, then he again says and i quote again part of the challenge is that we are still in an early phase of a major transition the contours of even the near future are not clear one solution to this is to anchor it on indian aspirations and speak of our emerging uh, our goal of emerging as a leading power yet there is no sense of what would be india's objective what would classify india as a leading power what would be india's objective where would india fit into um i presume if he says india is one leading power there are going to be many others and therefore i e multipolarity um in that multipolar world order what sort of a world order would that be would there be power differentials that would be unfavorable to india is multipolarity essentially in india's interest or not he doesn't engage with any of those tough, tough questions right i agree with you but i disagree with i agree with you on this point that he doesn't engage in all these tough questions but i uh, disagree with both of you in saying that he has not laid out a vision as in he has not laid out an objective partially <coughs> he's saying that structures in the world are changing and if you see the three classic terms role taker role shaper uh, role makers hmm. so india is on the threshold from india is changing india's role if you hmm. if he, he talks about risk taking and how yeah. india is start, started taking risk yeah so india is asserting at least he's say, saying in the speech that india is asserting itself more by taking different risk which it never took previously hmm. so india's position from role taker hmm. is changing to role shaper slowly or it is going more into role shaper it's not role maker and that is exactly what i'm trying to figure out where is our position changing from a role taker to a role shake to a role uh, shaper to a role maker given the fact that when we were negotiating a international agreement for the last 7 years you walked away at the last day so that how is, do you how do you shape norms when you walk away from the table but again if you see all these classic definitions if something is not in your national interest then you have to walk away from that right but that is exactly what i'm trying to tell you mm-hmm. you cannot be shaping global rules by only thinking about parochialism by turning your back away from exactly. the world you cannot be a rule maker in no way so i agree i am saying that india also, is not yet a rule maker india is a rule shaper shaper right you're now you're not even a rule shaper you walked away from the table <laughs> on also, the also he talks about india being the leading power yeah. now that is a problematic term hmm. in 2014 15 they alluded to that term quite a few times realized that india doesn't have capacities will power yeah and others are not going to accept india as a leading power as well so this thing was absent for about 4 years and suddenly it is now returning hmm. but what is a leading power but i'll sort of take that yes exactly and i'll take that to to one more step we'll move away from rcep okay rcep has its own complications and so on and so forth okay there was national interest uh, whatever the case however you define that in the case of rcep or at least how the government saw it let's talk about data governance um the osaka track dialogue began at the g20 summit um india walked away from it uh and the primary reason why india walked away from the osaka track i mean there is there's a lot of diplomatic speak there but the primary reason is because we still don't have a domestic legislation we don't have a domestic position we want to do data localization but we don't really know what that entails so far we clearly don't have an understanding of the contours of this thing mm. you are not even at the table again that is because of domestic compulsions we don't have capabilities Precise, for data localization exactly. so if you don't have capabilities you're never going to be a rule shaper mm-hmm. what you have today predominantly and i'm not meaning to beat down on uh, india in our foreign policy what i'm meaning to say is that uh, your foreign policy or ability to sort of shape rules and make rules eventually will depend on your capabilities like sankap said your capacity and your willingness what's being uh, political willingness will mean making certain compromises at the international level which will mean that you might not achieve everything that you want to achieve but you achieve relatively much more you are well off than where you were yet you've not necessarily achieved everything because there will be some trade offs my concern is internationally india has been far less willing to make some of these trade offs uh for the, because of domestic political compulsions and if this government is unable to do those sorts of changes or sort of make those sorts of trade offs then it's going to be really challenging for you to shape anything do anything um because you will need to make some trade offs right so you're trying to say that in certain instances we have capabilities but domestic compulsions are tying our hands behind rcep is an example of that and the fact that the government is giving into those compulsions 
is what tells you whether, and that might not necessarily be in the national interest so because in you might not be context, deformed. when he talks about dogmas of delhi yeah he might be alluding to alluding to very different sort of audience than you know what he means to perhaps because perhaps. you know i mean given this kind of because this thing made a lot of news that yeah. you know india's real challenges lie at home and yeah. you know like dogmas mm-hmm. of delhi needs to be discarded and that sort of stuff also interestingly he talks about um how do we reconcile mamallapuram and howdy modi hmm. like you know because yeah there was this criticism of sorts and you know yeah. interestingly i am not concerned about reconciling it's okay you do both of these things my concern starts later on what are you gaining out of it hmm. by making statements like apki baat trump sarkar or hmm. appearing to you know i mean please xi jinping at mamallapuram mm-hmm. without actually getting anything in return hmm. i am not sure i mean wh- wh- where are we actually headed to hmm. we can reconcile as many things as we are reek jay whatever i mean you know in yeah. russia india china <laughs> japan india america i mean what is this yaar no but again if how can you quantify the gains after such statements so for instance yesterday uh, trump administration approved 1 billion just i'm giving an example 1 billion dollar arm sales for india I, the details are not out yet yeah. but how can you quantify if certain things happened or certain thing doesn't happen how can you quantify it to that move quantify there is no quantification of that quantification right? is is possible to a level where you can see you know softening of stance in joint statements mm-hmm. say for example howdy modi Mm-hmm. they were talking about a trade deal which was supposed to happen now mm-hmm. that event took place on sometime in late september now mm-hmm. it's late november has any progress been made on late i mean on these trade deal no there hasn't been any progress made rather with the domestic political competition heating up in the us mm-hmm. india ended up on the wrong side tomorrow if something happens i mean you know Okay, so my sort of thought on that is that I don't, I, I'm, I'm, I was not a fan of the endorsement of the Trump uh, administration, but uh, I didn't mind it as much. Uh, but I, like I said, I was not a fan of it. Um, but on the whole, I see the Indo-US relationship important to both sides, and therefore both sides knowing that they have to work on it. But yet, not a case of it's foregone conclusion that this will be a close partnership. You need to work on this. um and i think that is underscored as far as uh, reconciling both of those i mean i have a little bit of sympathy there for the foreign minister because i think uh, what he's basically telling us is that look we need to engage and i think that is to me that's a realization of realities which is the case that look india's interest lies in being not necessarily a partner in a certain camp but india's interest lies in being in different tents where our interests coincide and that will mean that we will have to sip coconut water with Xi Jinping in Mamallapuram <laughs> and we will have to uh, you know meet with Donald Trump and shake his hands and massage his ego mm-hmm. uh, and that's just that's just the way the reality is in fact i would go a step further to say that look it's it's in india's interest to be a swing power of sorts and that what that would entail is having a better relationship with both the chinese and the americans than they have with each other um because then that allows you to be in a position where you can actually negotiate better so so i have a little bit of sympathy with him when he's arguing about that i also have a lot of sympathy with him when he's saying that look we should be meeting and we should be engaging with leaderships perfectly fine uh, my concern with the mamlapuram business has been about uh increasingly continuing with informality of these summits i would rather like to see them more structured i was okay with the first one uh, it made sense to me at that point of time given the nature of the given how precarious things had become um but i don't want to see this become institutionalized mm-hmm. because then it's about the optics as about as opposed to the structural things so i am a little bit sympathetic to him on that and i actually credit this government with having done a decent job of balancing some of these very complex things um yet like i said when it comes to uh certain tough decisions that need to be taken um they've not sort of tough decisions at a broad strategy so the rcep would have been a strategic decision and i think we've missed the boat on that um yet i sort of also agree that there is a greater risk taking appetite on certain fronts and i think uh, bala court is an example of that in so terms of foreign appetite policy. on fronts which are linked with domestic security issues whether they are dis- whether they are linked to domestic security issues or whether they are risk to a broader changing of our dyad with pakistan um i think there is a greater risk taking appetite in in that uh, in a foreign policy there has been a little bit of that uh 
and there has been some more purposeful engagement with other actors also so for example actors in the middle east mm-hmm. um my so the, the, so i and i don't dis, actually grudge uh, the foreign minister that i think he's absolutely right in that uh, that there is a little bit more risk taking appetite but i think the lack of a strategic vision is what's hindering uh, you know this government and you know in terms of legacy because if you look at uh, if you look at the last 20 years um there were three big decisions that india has taken in the last 20 odd years 30 years actually not even 20 years there are three big decisions that india has taken um the liberalization of the economy which had foreign implications um the nuclear tests of 1998 and then the indo us nuclear deal those are our three big decisions that we've taken none since, of which was in the last 10 years sir exactly none <laughs> of which has come in the last decade and uh, these have had implications which have played out over the last decade mm-hmm. at the moment we are not we had this uh, the rcep was a moment uh, which we have missed which would have probably counted in the future in that list however it eventually would have gone um and uh, that will happen only when you have a fundamental view about the world you know in 1991 there was a fundamental view about the world as much as it was forced upon india there was a change right the soviet union had collapsed the world was changing around us we needed to adapt and therefore we adapted in 1998 there was again a fundamental change about the view of the world we'd been under pressure for 6 7 8 years a little more than that also with regard to nuclear non proliferation and the ctbd regimes and all those sorts of things and there was a case of look this you have to do this at a certain point of time and that government took that decision the vajpay government took the decision subsequently under manmohan singh when we are pursuing and and george bush when you are pursuing this nuclear deal um, there was a fundamental realization that our relationship with the us is important to our future sort of strategic outlook and it needs to be reshaped and that was on both sides and therefore it was in that context that this deal was pursued so opening up to israel uh, opening up of economy nuclear test and nuclear deal uh, you cannot count rcep per se into the same basket because it's a trade negotiation and we already have ftas with 12 of the 15 rcep countries so we are talking to them on trade different different it's not about a bilateral fta this mm-hmm. is about setting a multilateral uh, mm-hmm. regime trading regime mm-hmm. of how goods and services should be traded multilaterally what the standards should be and so on and so forth this would have set rules not just for between you and another country it would have set rules between an within an entire trading block you would have created an entire trading block which would have included three of the most dynamic and important economies in asia Japan, China, and also, India. Also, just to interject here, so imagine a situation where you are part of the RCEP. Countries which are part of TPP, except US, US decided to leave, come together with RCEP, and they are they are also part of that trading block. And imagine another US president probably willing to come in and see the kind of trading linkage that you you will see, or the kind of trading block that you will get to see. Interestingly, in the entire speech related to this. uh he doesn't emphasize economic power as much as you know it should be given the kind of economic slump that india finds itself in because finally india's source of sort of military power or even diplomatic willingness will come from the economic growth and as some people would say you know 8% or 10% economic growth is with correct numbers not mm-hmm. fudged numbers is probably the most basic foreign policy principle and it also does not get emphasized as it should have been given the you know requirements of that no but you have to understand is that foreign policy is essentially all of us know that foreign policy is essentially ex- extension of national interest anything that us does for shaping the world making world it is linked with their national interest in case of rcep there were genuine concerns regarding chinese goods entering indian markets so our national interest was at stake over there just for the sake of shaping rule we cannot allude to all these practices so right that government is, is calling itself a leading power mm-hmm. right I but mean. see it, but the, the, the issue is this it's mm-hmm. not just about chinese goods entering the indian markets it's also you getting access to the chinese market right exactly We, but, <laughs> india has been talking about not getting access to the chinese market for mm-hmm. a very long time mm-hmm. uh, this was about you also getting access to the chinese market if you are worried about chinese goods entering the indian market you already have about a 60 billion dollar trade deficit with them no, but the problem has been done without an fta yeah. so uh, my point is this if that was your genuine concern how do you become more competitive so that you can compete with those goods is by making sure that your industry was more competitive in 7 years of negotiation towards this pact knowing fully well that you're negotiating a free trade agreement which will which will entail this which will entail this 
Did you seek to carry out the reforms? Did you firstly examine the potential impact? And did you then seek to carry out the reforms that you thought was necessary if this was an objective that you wanted to achieve? Mm -hmm. And if you did not do that, and at the last minute you realized, I mean, it finds, I find it a little bit strange that at the last minute you realize that, oh, this is going to be a problem. And that is where my point, that is where the argument is. That if you want to be a rule shaper, if you want to be a rule maker, you need to think more purposefully and act more purposefully. Also, I, I agree with this. In domestic, one, when yeah. India opened itself, was India ready? No. I mean, you see 91 and read the kind of... But 91 India was forced to open itself. It, yes. We are not forced to sign our but separate... But that is the whole point. No, 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 no. When, you exactly. are, when, you are a, when you want to be a leading power and when you are a leading power... You have to shape circumstances and not let circumstances shape you. That is the whole point of it. If you have, if we are still in a position where circumstances are shaping us by and large, we are, do not have the capacity, therefore, and neither are we cultivating the capacity necessarily. Oh, I That's agree with point. your point that we should have done things in seven years, but now, not uh, not reflecting on the past, now going forward, since we have not done that. I think opening was not our opening up was but that is my point is that, yeah, this, yeah. that those seven years most of those seven years were under this government exactly, I agree yeah. and they therefore they should have done that if this was a political objective and that they and had now in the world in which you are not part of our mm-hmm. they are not even giving us any other alternative vision as well in the speech that, that you know that's my other point that he, has, do. that he has that he does not provide us with any other vision of how will India become this leading power and what does being a leading power exactly. mean exactly I mean you can't be doing Iraq or Afghanistan sort of scenarios by being a leading power. I mean, let's, yeah, let's do that. Let's take a couple of minutes and talk about Afghanistan. We know that the US is looking to withdraw. Uh, It will withdraw in one form or the other. That withdrawal does not obviously mean every American soldier is gone. There will be some sort of basing over there. That's our assumption. Let us look at India from the point of view of, let us look at India's role in Afghanistan post an American withdrawal. Today, we are really not at the conversation table in Afghanistan. It's, I can see that there are maybe multiple views of whether we should be at the table and whatever. But do we have a vision for where we want to be in a post-withdrawal scenario? And are we working towards that vision? And this is our immediate region. This is our immediate security interests that will be hindered, hurt. I have not seen any articulation of what an Indian vision is going, is with regard to the future of Afghanistan, apart from the very boilerplate and Afghan led, Afghan said peace process and so on and so forth. And, you know, and, you know, us, we engage with the legitimate government and we don't talk to terrorists and so on and so forth. And that's fine rhetorically. But the fact is that you are not at the table anymore. And this is a matter which is of your immediate security interest within your broader region. And I think that counts as a limitation of our foreign policy, if not a failure. Also, we don't have the capacity to act in Afghanistan if other players decide to, you know, just sideline Indian interest and move on with exactly. the whatever and situation. And that's happening, right? And so today you have China, Pakistan, Russia and the US holding a quadrilateral dialogue on Afghanistan. And India is nowhere in the picture. So, but in a hypothetical scenario, if there is a Taliban-led regime in Afghanistan tomorrow, how do we know that we are not a stakeholder? We don't talk to Taliban, I know that. But you no, don't no, no, know we what? talk to Taliban. It's huh. not that they're having some overtures. Yeah. It's not like completely we have shunned Taliban out. But we prefer a. But yeah, I mean, to, not as uh, uh, as purposefully as say others have been. Yeah. Or yeah. So how do we know that uh, our intelligence agencies? I'm not, are not talking. I'm not to saying them. that. What mm-hmm. I'm saying is, uh, uh, I can only talk about what we know. Yeah. Okay. What we know is that not a single official from the Indian government has been able to paint a picture of. What sort of an Afghanistan does India want? Mm -hmm. And not a fantasy picture, given the realities of Afghanistan. And how are we working to achieve that? There is no, there is no articulated vision. There is no articulated steps. And there is nothing that we are seeing play out in the public domain. But for example, the Chinese, the Americans, the Pakistanis and the Russians, I'm sure they also have intelligence contacts with the Taliban. But what they are doing is also playing out in the public domain. We understand that they are negotiating with each other. They are talking to each other to shape the future of Afghanistan. India is not in part of that conversation. India is not in the conversation at all on Afghanistan. And I think that is a limitation of our foreign policy. Whether our intelligence agencies are working behind the scenes and all that is perfectly fine. Do they have networks? I'm sure they might have. 
Yet, the problem is we don't have a vision articulated for where we want to go. And if you don't have a vision, even if you have intelligence agencies working, they will not know what exactly to you are achieving. Your objective needs to be clear. Interestingly, India doesn't want to be a rule taker. Good enough. India is not in a position right now to be a rule maker. But can India be a rule breaker? And with Afghanistan context, I'm not sure we have that sort of capacity. I mean, realistically speaking, we have lots of friends in Afghanistan. But I think they would also be circumspect counting on India because, you know, overall, given the India's approach towards Afghanistan. So, so where do we fit India? We are not a rule breaker. We are not a rule shaper yet. We are definitely a rule maker and we don't want to be a rule taker. No, at, the pre- at present, we are largely a rule taker. Mm-hmm. We have occasionally broken rules. For example, WTO, WTO, the, yeah, the yeah, NPT. NPT. No, I mean, I wouldn't say the WTO so much. I mean, there are much, mm. there are far more egregious things than what India has done. But the NPT is a classic example of where we did not take the rule and whatever the norm was, we did not acknowledge it. And when we tested, we potentially sort of broke some rule, although we hadn't accepted that rule. Um, but beyond that, we are a shaper in some ways. Yet our ability to shape those rules is not necessarily... Uh, I would say that in the 1950s, we were far more influential in terms of Asian in, impact, in, yeah. in, in, if not necessarily in shaping things, but at least in terms of the narrative of how things were moving. As we spoke in that podcast yeah. on Nehruvian. Exactly. We yeah, were punching yeah. above our weight. Today, uh, I think uh, we could, we should be doing much, much more in terms of shaping rules. Unfortunately, we're not being able to do that because my sense is that we don't have clarity on domestic issues significantly. And the classic example is cyberspace governance, data governance, these sorts of things. 5G. 5G. We've not really had clarity on some of these things. Yet on some other things, we're possibly trying to shape things, but we are again limited by capacity. One classic example is this attempt once again to try and create some sort of a uh, oil buyers club with China, mm. uh, where you want to shape the way the market functions in some way. Um, we, you can't do it on your own um, because you need far more capacity and let's be real there is the capacity does not exist Um, China today is influencing global norms influencing events around the world that is at a 13 plus trillion dollar economy at a 2.7 2.8 trillion dollar economy you can't necessarily shape it what allows us to shape market whatever is the potential of our market and the potential growth Um, and also some ways in some ways our geography that allows us to do some of these things, but it also creates our own. So that is where the economic growth part comes in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To which he doesn't necessarily allude as much time as he should have probably. You know, which is again quite that, strange, right? Given that, you know, I remember when in 2014, uh, Mr. Modi had come to power. One of the things that he'd spoken about was uh, greater economic diplomacy. Diplomacy for the purpose of development and these sorts of things. Unfortunately, we've gone away from those narratives. But if now, you if you if you look at his speech and after the speech he has given a talk uh, he is engaged in question answer session with Raja Mohan, so he's talking there about economic. So he concedes the fact that some of our some of the countries in the world he doesn't name the country, and it is obvious for people to guess it. Uh, some of the countries can engage in aid diplomacy at a much higher level. And we don't have capacities for that. But we are doing, a, at least he says, so, we are doing a lot in our neighborhood. For any classic example is Bangladesh. So in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, he has not talked about Sri Lanka per se. But we are engaging in aid diplomacy. So for, he gives an example of Nepal. So we, it is an unreported fact that we are, we are building a train from point A to point B. He gave some example in Nepal. So with our limited capability, I understand, I concede the point that uh, we have a limited capability. But with our limited capability, we are engaging with our neighbors uh, in aid diplomacy. No, no, Sush, diplomacy. The question is this. Every government does things. Mm-hmm. Every government wants to claim success and credit for whatever they are doing. Question is that Manoj has been talking about that I would like to see is this that given that you are at a certain capacity threshold and you want to achieve certain things, how do you want to move from say point A to point B and what will that point B be, you know, in your future? That is something that we could have liked to see, you know, given that this government is fresh in power. I mean, you know, it's just been like six months. So you should draft out your objective point B and then you should improve your capabilities. Until you have clarity on where you want to go, Mm -hmm. uh, firstly, where you want to go, then you think about how you want to get there. To me, most of where we want to go, uh, uh, I mean, there's some sort of an understanding of that when he talks about multipolarity and all of that in India being a pole potentially. How you want to get there 
uh, is very very unclear um, because a lot of that will be domestic capacity building domestic capacity development and that does not necessarily mean closing yourself to the world um, that will mean certain trade offs yes of course a classic case is china um as close as as much criticism as china gets today for being closed and you know being unfair and all of that and all of that is justified um china did open up um and china did allow foreign actors to enter the country it in investment manpower everything and even today for as close as china is it has it collaborates with a lot of foreign tech companies mm-hmm. much more than india does it, you've got an nyu Ch- shanghai campus you don't have foreign universities in india um so there's a big divide between how we see things and how things actually function no, but that's a class different but i don't want to get into different debate because that is the not a scope of this conversation no, my, my point is, is my no, point is being yeah. open yeah with purpose and the fact that at every point look there are going to be trade offs mm-hmm. in whatever you do mm-hmm. whatever sector you open you are going to trade off there was a point of time where this country was sitting and debating debating breathlessly whether we should be have open to single single brand retail multi brand retail and god knows what not and those are also very deeply political decisions mm-hmm. at the end of the day any protected interest group will want to see those protections continue um that does not mean that you open up your systems completely uh, to shock therapy but you need to be far more purposeful in your opening up because you cannot you cannot be part of a global system while walling yourself up it just does not work uh, and if you want to be competing globally you need to be open globally we are nowhere in the technology sub- technology chain so su- supply chains we need to be in those chains um, so we need there's lots more that needs to be done um So yeah. we can sort of you know using his own words we will see whether they have managed to read the global tea leaves right or not <laughs> yeah. absolutely okay so with that we're going to wrap up it's been a long conversation we'd love to hear what you think about this conversation and uh, if you have any feedback brick bats criticisms or things that we've ignored and missed or things that we've not we've not necessarily got right do please write and reach out to us uh, sankalp and sushesh can you please share your twitter handle so people can come and criticize you Oh yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> Hi, I am Sankal. I can be reached at Sankal Gurjar. Uh, you can follow me at Suya Shandar Score Desai, and I am uh, at the China Dude. Um, thank you so much for listening to us. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM Network. You can tune into them on the IVM Podcast app, ivmpodcast dot com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila I N S T or our website Takshashila dot O R G dot in. Hi, I'm Sariyu Natarajan, and I'm Alok Prasanna Kumar. and we are the hosts of the ganatantra podcast on this podcast we speak to academics social scientists journalists and activists to find out what's actually going on in indian politics on this podcast we stay away from personality politics intrigue and gossip and instead focus on the data research and analysis that drives all this so tune in to the ganatantra podcast where new episodes are out every wednesday on the ivm podcast app website or wherever you listen to your podcasts The modern world is obsessed with food and agriculture Everywhere you look new and exciting technologies are bringing food innovation to your street market your grocery store your doorstep and your plate From our quest for the perfect food photos to our rediscovery of ancient grains Quite simply food has never been sexier But guess what The modern food system is broken. It's a major cause of climate change, antibiotic resistance, and global poverty. So how did we get here and where are we going? Most importantly, how are we going to feed 10 billion people globally by the year 2050 through better, more sustainable means? I'm Varun Deshpande and I'm Ramya Ramurthy and we work for the Good Food Institute, a global non-profit accelerating the transformation to a more healthy, sustainable and just food system. The next food revolution is here. On Feeding 10 Billion, we're giving you the inside view. 
You can tune into us every Tuesday on the IVM Podcast app or ivmpodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts from.